Sometimes it's hard to tell what you might come across in our annual tour. And obviously today we come across something that's a little bit more poignant than some of the other offerings in along the tour. And to my right, the Reverend Robert Chase is gonna tell us all about it. It looks like ribbons in the sky to me. You tell us what it's all about. Thank you, Stan. So this is Ribbons of Hope. It was originally created in the aftermath of 9-11 and the 10th anniversary as a way to commemorate and provide a kind of a community art project for people of all ages and of all perspectives to add their thought for hope, for peace, for the future of humankind. And so we um, had these in Battery Park during the weekend of 9-11 in in uh, at the 10th anniversary. And then subsequently, they've traveled all around the New York City region. And the hope is that we'll ultimately bring them even internationally. We have about 25,000 people from all over the world that have added their thoughts for hope, uh, for peace, for the future of humankind uh, on these, uh, these panels. And um, they've really been uh, a remarkable way of continuing the legacy of 9-11 uh, in a hopeful way. So it's not a fixed showing, it's still interactive. Absolutely. The, the thing about this that we think makes it so exciting is that it, it continues to grow, it continues to evolve, it continues to change and reflect the history of the moment so that as different people come up and add their thoughts and their perspectives, uh, it is an evolving expression of hope uh, for the future. This was originally created by six faith-based interfaith organizations in New York City, which formed a coalition called Prepare New York. The idea was, and it had its, uh, its genesis really at the ninth anniversary of 9-11 when there was the controversy around the mosque in, uh, at Ground Zero. And a group of us from the faith-based community felt that uh, we wanted to create something that would help to bring people together. And so what we did was we formed this coalition called Prepare New York. And this activity seeks to create a human mosaic, irrespective of the diff different uh, faith groups or different neighborhoods or different perspectives, um, so that what we might do is together live in peace and harmony and have this as a living tribute, really, not only to those who uh, perished tragically at 9-11, but moving into the future as an expression of, of how we might live together in a new way as we, uh, as we face our future together across lines of difference. One of the great things about Ribbons of Hope has been that we have had people from uh, those who were actually in the towers at the time of the attack to children who weren't born yet during that fateful day. And so all those different perspectives have come together and each individual ribbon uh, may not say a whole lot, but when you put them all together, 25,000 of them, there's a real uh, powerful statement about how we can live together, both young and old, people from all across the world. We have a, a whole series of, of ribbons from Australia, from Hungary, from Norway, in the wake of the tragedy that happened a couple of years ago when, when that person uh, killed a bunch of kids. And, um, and yet, when you read them time after time, the statements are saying, we need to live together, we need to have peace, we need to uh, uh, forget about our differences and find common ground. Every place that these uh, uh, ribbons have gone, and we've had them at the New York Public Library, we've had them at the United Nations, we've had them in various uh, mosques and synagogues and churches around New York City, there's the opportunity for people to fill out their own ribbons and to add to this, uh, to this display. And in fact, we're doing that here in Jersey City at this Artist's Walk so that, again, kids and families and, uh, and all kinds of folks can come and participate and, and help this display grow. I'm Frederick Johnson and I'm the uh, Artistic Director at Intersections International, which is one of the organizations that partnered with this amazing initiative, Ribbons of Hope. As we travel around the world and do our social justice work, I mean, we begin to realize that there are so many, many feelings, ideas that we have in common. And one of the ways of really connecting to that is through art and creative expression. One of the opportunities that I had was to go to Israel during the period of time that we were gathering ribbons from around the world to be a part of this exhibit that would really exemplify that the world really is now in a place where we want to be hopeful. We want to be able to have our thoughts and ideas heard and that we come together and really speak as one. 
So as a musician, I travel to Israel and I do a lot of work working with both the Jewish and the Muslim community, really having conversations around the things that we have in common as opposed to focusing on the things that are different about us and really trying to recognize that the things that are different about us is, is what makes the life experience really beautiful. So we had the opportunity to gather with both young Jewish teenagers and young Arabic te Muslim teenagers and we played music and we communicated about how important it is to really dream and realize that we can realize our dreams and really try to show the world that people do want to be together. And we were able at that time to take these ribbons of hope and everybody wrote their words and their ideas and we brought them back to the United States and they hang here now on this exhibit. It's funny, you know, we tend to think that life is real complicated and we have to have complicated answers. But to simply give ourselves permission to consider that hope is a possibility, to desire that hope is a possibility and write it down. Regardless of what your belief is, whether it's a religious belief or a philosophical belief, most of the great texts of the world say that if you acknowledge it, if you write it, if you put it into the world, that it can happen. I think that these ribbons of hope exemplify that. A simple example to say, let's speak what we believe and let's let it move through the world. Because I really think that that's what hope is all about. I'm uh, Jim Pastorino. I'm uh, the director and the curator here at the new art center that we're developing in Jersey City, uh, the drawing rooms at uh, the OLC Art Center. And uh, behind me is a piece of my own, uh, which is based on uh, kind of like an abstract comic strip sort of idea. Uh, at the time I was working on it, uh, I was working with the artist who's across the room here from me, uh, Ibu uh, Ndoy. And uh, yeah, he has a large piece on carpet and uh, that we, we set up uh, in the room together so that we could kind of balance each other out. Uh, we started a publishing uh, system called Victory Hall Press and uh, earlier this year we did two books with Ibu because he's been uh, creating books on cardboard and while we were developing those I borrowed probably or got inspired by some of his colors. He's from Senegal, he's been in uh, Jersey City for about 10 years and uh, it's nice these small rooms uh, of the convent we have recently renovated allow us to put a couple of artists together where they can pair off with each other, where you can kind of look at both pieces at once or several pieces at once in a more intimate setting. So um, also in the room, if you see over here, uh, is a, another person we've been working with a lot, Carl Vareau. Um, we thought these worked very well in here because um, in contrast to uh, Ibu and my own busyness, Carl is uh, very reserved and uh, I think he gets a lot of impact out of uh, the, uh, the few shapes and lines that he has here. So all of this work is seen a little bit more almost like a pictogram or a pictograph where uh, it's kind of a, it's not, a, it's not making an illusion but it is kind of telling a story. to something pretty interesting. To my left is an editor that I'm very familiar with, John Crittenden, editor with the Jersey Journal. John, tell us a little bit about what's behind us. Obviously, we have art, capturing art and life. Well, photojournalists don't get enough credit, don't get enough um, appreciation. And I've been thinking about doing this show for a couple of years because I want to get some appreciation for them. Uh, I've seen so many good photographers come through the Jersey Journal in the last few years and I just wanted to do something for them to celebrate them and also show, have the public show uh, some appreciation for 
the work that they do. The dexterity of a photojournalist, they have to be ready at any given moment to shoot a sporting event, a civic event, council meetings, just anything that's unpredictable in real life. Yeah, an accident. We've got one photograph here of a car that went into a Dunkin' Donuts on Central Avenue here in Jersey City. I was uh, at the desk writing headlines and editing copy and I saw the photographer being dispatched to go get us some pictures and an hour later he came back with pictures and was on page one the next day. That's photojournalism. That's showing the reader and everybody else uh, what's going on in our world. And that's why I subtitled the title of the show, Seven Photographers Respond to the Scene. And I don't think enough people appreciate it. So that's, that, that was the genesis of this show, was to uh, show their work, get people to, to see it and, and see it for what it is. Just looking at the diversity of the photographs, there's always someone who can get a special shot. Now, all these photos seem to be able to stand on their own. There's small captions to explain them, but it is true, and a lot of cliches really aren't, but picture is a thousand words. When you have a really good photojournalist, picture's worth a million words. These pictures are pretty self-explanatory, but every now and then you'll see one that's a cut above. Um, I'm sure there are a few that you've seen, particularly in this show. Let's talk about those first. Yes, well, one of our great uh, photographers right now is Lauren Castleberry, and these sports shots over here um, show that. And one of our other photographers in the show is Steve Gold. He shoots for the Jersey Journal, he shot for the Independent, uh, and a lot of other publications. Some of the soccer shots were in one of the soccer magazines. Uh, he does a lot of city council work, uh, showing people in government. Um, um, now, one of these have, have actually gone national. Let's talk about that photo. This picture was taken in 2006 by Andrew Miller. It's of the Tribute of Light. It was shot from the 22nd floor of the Goldman Sachs building. This was picked up by the Associated Press, and the next morning after the uh, fifth anniversary of the September 11, this photograph was on newspapers, front pages around the world. It's been used ever since, and I think the most recent use of it was in USA Today just this past September. So, some photographs do have a long life and do have widespread exposure and others, uh, a lot of the others don't. And yet they're photographs that deserve to be seen. One of the things that surprised me in putting this show together, and it's a reminder of something I already knew, photojournalism has gotten a lot looser with fewer rules over the years. Uh, they used to be pretty static and they were in black and white, and now they're obviously in color. They're, there's not such a rigid format for them, and a lot of more sensitive subjects are used. And this is one of them that is particularly interesting. It's a 55-year-old man and his wife, and he has early onset Alzheimer's. It appeared in the Star Ledger. It was taken by Andrew Miller. And probably 10 or 15 years ago, you wouldn't have seen a picture of an Alzheimer's patient in the news. I wasn't surprised at the diversity of the pictures, but I was really surprised at the complexity that each photographer brought to it. It's a personal vision thing and no two photographers photograph the exact same thing in the exact same way. That's just the way photography is. So you have in this show seven different visions of the way to interpret the news and get it.
from Jersey City Cultural Affairs, run by our good friend, Marianne Kelleher, Greg, Greg Brickey, her able assistant, and the whole staff. And uh, this is the 22nd annual Jersey City Studio Arts Tour, and it gets bigger and better every single year. As most of you know, Jersey City is a haven for the arts, all kinds of arts. It improves whatever whatever venue it is, whatever city, town it is. So we're, we're grateful to have this great arts presence here in Jersey City. We, it makes our city better, and anything we can do to continue it, to expand it, and to grow it, we stand ready, willing, and hopefully able to do so. Thanks for coming down again. God bless you. See you all. All right, folks at home, that was Friday night's grand opening, and thanks to the mayor for coming down to the Tenmark buildings here at 430 Communipaw Avenue and getting things off in the right foot. So what you're going to see for the next several moments are such a great variety of the hundreds of artists who participated in this year's Jersey City Annual Artist Studio Tour. Stay tuned and enjoy the show. We're shifting gears here down at the 10 mark and talk about different kinds of mediums. We had some photo art going. We had an um, opportunity to see some photojournalists a little while ago down by Benson, um, Benson Gallery, Mary Benson Gallery that is. But now with Daniel Morte to my left, tell us about your version of photography. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, this year I decided to do something really different. Um, I believe that photography is a great way to show some uh, history of a place and a person. So when I had the opportunity to go to Cuba last May, I wanted to be able to capture elements of Cuba and bring it back to Jersey City. And this is how I have this new series here called Havana Dreams. Um, last May I was able to go to Havana, Cuba to work on a documentary of Ben Jones, a local artist. Uh, it was funded by Prestige Media Productions. And um, while I was down there, I bought my personal camera and I really wanted to show uh, a side of uh, Cuba that not many people really see because of the political and economical situations that goes on. A lot of people think that Cuba has this, this uh, conception of being a military run place where you know it's very strict and all this violence is going on. But I really wanted to show that it has so much history and culture and beauty that is still flourishing down there. Tell us, what was the most, um, I don't know, satisfying or overwhelming, unexpected surprise you found there? Oh man, there was so many. Uh, the simple things, like seriously, like I went into complete strangers' houses and they welcomed me with open arms, gave me a meal, sat down, watched their TV. I mean, just the interaction that people have, you know, just because you don't know someone is not an excuse not to say hi. And they were so friendly, so friendly down there. Especially when you're an American and you come there and you, you know, so you just want to absorb and see the culture, you know. It's, it was a really humbling experience. It reminds me that, um, that they have something that, you know, we're losing more and more today in modern times, humility. You know, they don't have much, but they are willing to give you everything they have just to, just to make people happy, which is now, really cool. Now, before you took the trip, or is this something that evolved once you got there and you saw the richness of the culture, or did you really anticipate having this kind of showing? Uh, mm, mm. I wasn't anticipating much, actually, you know. Um, my state of mind was, you know, I was doing a project, a documentary, and then my focus was on the work. But then when I was having conversations with various people who had um, positive uh, reviews on, on Cuba and negative reviews on Cuba, I was like, hmm, I want to bring back something that um, at least have them involved in conversation again so they can maybe change their minds or at least have a little more information about uh, what goes on in Cuba. And, uh, you know, I've gotten many, many amazing reactions. Uh, Yesterday, I was just uh, I was told by another photographer that came through that he brought his mom here, and his mom burst into tears because I believe that's her old neighborhood. 
wow. and she was it reminded her so much of her childhood and honestly with all the money I spent getting these printed out and all the effort of taking it here and the fact that you know I'm saying haven't slept in days uh, that moment made all this so worth it do you have a website people can look forward to and a timetable as far as uh, the completion of the documentary uh, the documentary hopefully will be op will be uh, ready by this time next year, and uh, you can reach me at my website, which is kodakjones.com, uh, K O D K O D A Q J O N E Z dot com. Also have morteexperience dot com, M O R T E H experience dot com. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing your work. Yeah, thank you.